Okay. <laughs> Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to, of course, Redgate DB Ale, the podcast that is all about data and beer, and increasingly uh, DevOps jokes about my mum and Chris not remembering to get the beer he said he was going to. Of course, my name is Chris. If it helps, I've also forgotten about uh, your mum and to make jokes about your mum. Of course, my name is Chris. And I can't remember my name. What? My name is what? My name is... (laughs) Slim Chrissy. Slim Chrissy. I like it. Yeah, that's definitely not true. Oh, dear. (laughs) You know what? I put it down to all the tortilla chips I ate before this meeting, but I'm feeling good. I've only had two donuts today. Stick a fork in me, Chris. I am done. Anyway, welcome everyone to this uh, episode 35, I think, of DBL. Can you believe we've been going for so long? My goodness. Uh, If we make it to 36, Chris, you realise that will be three years worth of episodes. And hey, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But guess what? What? Today, we are going to be talking about the Olympics of database DevOps. That is, of course... Oh, how topical. How topical. That is, of course, we are. We were a little bit late to record for the uh, Olympics. However, we are just in time to record for the Paralympics. And fortunately, uh, Team GB is off to a flying start. In fact, it seems like the games have been absolutely wonderful so far. And massive congratulations to everyone who has been taking part. But today, you can expect Chris and I to talk about the different stages of uh, database DevOps and your kind of maturity as an organization when implementing database DevOps. And then uh, once we've spoken about the bronze, the silver and the gold of database DevOps, we will, of course, bring you the uh, data breach news for the month, followed by uh, the events digest and rundown, all as part of our beloved news. You just want to say it twice in one episode. That's greedy. News. Chris, did you compete in the Olympics? Chris, there isn't a category for the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> if there was, you'd get gold, my friend. I oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I like being the best. Uh, no, I didn't, unfortunately. But Chris, if you were competing in a sport, let's say you competed in the sport of remembering what beer to bring to DBL several months in a row, I'm afraid you would not. Uh, well, no, if you were in the sport of forgetting, you would get, get a gold, 100%. Oh, cutting comeback. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> so smooth just like this beer so hey. the beer i've got is karaoke tears how's that for a segue baby whiffed cut so what beer were you supposed to get chris uh i think i was supposed to get one called karaoke tears no you were supposed to get one called golden champion or the golden champion by uh the badger dorset brewers and golden it- champion it's a bright golden ale with floral hints of elderflower, light and refreshing, a crisp taste of summer. It is summer, the Olympics are on, and guess what? If you are a champion at the Olympics, you are a golden champion. But no, unfortunately, even though I reminded you twice, you didn't get it. So you it's instead true. have... It's true. I have karaoke tears. So I like this. That late night karaoke haze. We've all been there. When emotions run high and the song cue keeps building, when our tuning isn't quite there and everyone knows it, when we are absolutely crushing it but no one cares, sometimes <laughs> tears follow. Brewed to celebrate those off key moments in front of friends and strangers, karaoke tears hits that high note with melodious hop aromas and no actual tears. That is an extremely dramatic thing to put on the side of your cat. I was going like, to wow. say. Something you read on the sofa whilst you're scratching your belly, opening your third can, and you go, hmm, yeah, interesting, (laughs) and then forget about it. 
<laughs> scratching your belly thinking, yes, this is exactly how I feel in a camp <laughs> form. Exactly. And I Chris, why did over. you why did you get this one? Well, it's the best I could do. I went into Milada and I see what I could find. And the only thing I could find that was vaguely related to the Olympics or Japan or the Paralympics was this one. It's got karaoke in the name. No, 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 I didn't do okay. too badly. No, I think you've done well, actually. If, if you'd have come back in with, like, I don't know, a Stella, then I'd have been like, Chris, I'm, I'm thinking wires are crossed here, perhaps. Yeah, that, no chance of that happening, Chris. I have toast. <laughs> I like Stella. And by that, I right. mean taste buds. Hang on, I'm going to open up this champions. Nice. So, Chris, golden champion, Olympics theme. Why exactly are we uh, crowing on so much about these things? Why is this our theme? Why is this See, our that theme? That segue was not smooth. That was not smooth, uh, unlike this beer. Oh. Oh. Mm. Oh, it's such a good beer. Golden Champion has has been probably for the last 10 or 11 years of my life, one of my favorite beers to drink. It's just a beautiful golden ale. Anyway. But what you're telling me is that the reason we got the Olympics theme is to shoehorn or crowbar in your favorite beer. Uh, it's actually the only reason that Japan went ahead with the Olympics was so that I would be able to drink a Golden Champion for DBL. <laughs> I thought that was the reason they were trying to cancel the Olympics. No, no, I got on the blower and I said, folks, I know you're trying to cancel the Olympics, but hear me out. I've got DBL to record. And when they heard that, I mean, obviously they knew who I was and they bent over backwards just to, you know, make sure they still went ahead. I think it was very kind of them. Uh, like, but... oi, oi, Abe, come on, give me... <laughs> Give me an Olympic so I can so I can get this uh, really good segue. And he was like, "I'm not I'm not the prime minister anymore, Chris." And I was the like, oh, was gone. "Wrong number, sorry." <laughs> Hang up. Uh, no, of course today we're talking about uh, golden champions because we're here to talk about the champions of database DevOps, the star performers. You know. Yes, okay, there are there are the people out there like uh, you know, Facebook and Skyscanner, Skyscanner who deploy what four or five hundred times a day, uh, with with a little bit of help from uh, you know who, of course. But what Santa we're talk- is Santa, right? Santa and Redgate, they actually work together. There's a workshop, elves. I knew that actually- red and white was a meaningful color choice. Okay. Yeah, well, exactly. That's why you always end up with a database stuffed in your stocking at Christmas. Uh, but no, of course, we're going to be talking about some of the behaviours that typify these sorts of performers. And we'll talk about kind of what it is that makes up the kind of bronze, silver and gold of star performers. Um, but the interesting thing is, Chris, the interesting thing is... More interesting than what you just said. More interesting than what I've just said, which is not hard because most of the things I say aren't inherently interesting, but more interesting than that, the thing to the thing to bear in mind when we talk about all of this, right, is that when you think about the Olympics and you think about people who win gold medals, do they stop? Like, do they go, oh, I've won a gold medal. That's it. I never need to compete again. I never need to perform again. I even never need to run again. I was going to say, of course they don't stop, Chris, because otherwise they wouldn't cross the line. But no, you've got to continuously strive and there's always people nipping at your heels and there's always faster, right? Like you can always do better. Like you're uh, running the 100 meter sprint, you're Usain Bolt, you've got the world record. Well, now you can strive to beat it again. Exactly. You you are now your own greatest competitor. And with complacency comes falling behind in the medals league and sometimes even off of the podium. The wonderful thing about uh, the wonderful thing about the Olympics and about, uh, I suppose, sports and athletics in general. Is that there's always going to be a new technique. There's always going to be a new approach. There's always going to be new technology. Right. Even football. Right. Football has changed over the years. People have gotten 
faster, they've gotten stronger, they've gotten paid more, they've jumped higher, they've gotten paid a lot more. We've introduced uh, VAR, which some would argue is a good thing, some would argue is a bad thing. But the thing is, the landscape is always changing. And the landscape of technology is also always changing. So just because you're one of the world's highest performers in DevOps right now, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to continue being the highest performer in the next few years if you don't constantly strive to not reinvent the wheel, but do the most important thing that comes along with a DevOps process, feedback, review, and improve. It's the great thing about IT, right? Nothing ever changed. Well, no, opposite of that. Everything always changes. Everything always changes. Just because you know how to do... Uh, I don't know, infrastructure as code doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the next master of Kubernetes. So yeah. those, I just like those, saying Kubernetes. <laughs> those people who, what, 10 years ago who were masters of Ruby on Rails. Yeah. <laughs> or a few years ago when Hadoop was the big thing that everyone wanted uh, expertise in. Now, machine learning. There's always another big thing. Yeah, artificial intelligence, Kubernetes. I didn't want to say kubernetes actually but i couldn't contain myself uh. <laughs> that's fine i wouldn't worry about it these jokes uh that only a few of them come to me at a time they're just you'll find them in a cluster and then awful absolutely <laughs> awful. <laughs> yes good good oh dear okay so right. What we're saying is that there's lots of different standards, I guess. And what we want to talk about is how people can achieve that, what the differences is between the, the different standards and how what good looks like, what um, the level below that looks like, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the obvious place to start is the wooden spoon. <laughs> I don't know if the concept of the wooden spoon translates globally, uh, but in the in the UK, generally, it means last place, right? You've you've tried your hardest, but you've come last. Here's your wooden spoon. Wait, and it's, really? Uh, I thought that was that for the what? bestest person award. Oh, I thought I thought you were just collecting for your soup collection. Do you not think? Man, I got so many wooden spoons. I think I've got some thinking to do. Yes, absolutely. But Chris, what what would you say typifies someone who you would who who you might say is a not even a, a last place? I think la even last place is someone trying to improve. Let's go with uh, did not finish. No, did not start. <laughs> DNS. Definitely, definitely, Harry in accounting. Oh, I mean, what have you got against Harry? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for us, I think there's a few people we talk to who um maybe have not really got the starting block when it comes to devops so don't really have an understanding i guess of of really what it is at all the processes that they are running are um extremely high touch processes i say with fingers uh in makeshift yeah, like apostrophes, quote you marks. Ask, you ask someone what their deployment process is and they have to stop and really think about what a deployment process is. Yeah. Well, we write a script and a few of us write a script and then we dump it in a folder and then we yeah. give it to Jeff. And then the reaction Jeff's on is leave, suddenly like, oh, I guess I wouldn't really call it a process, but... but yes, I, I hear that so often. And to be fair, for some people... and very very few people but a lot of people when they talk about this process i even saw it on stack overflow the other day which was how do you manage your database deployments and people are saying you know it's not that i'm proud of this but we write scripts we give them to the dba the dba runs them against the environment if they work we promote them if they don't we rework them bish bash bosh and there's only so many times you can promote a dba this is true. This is absolutely true. Uh, senior DBA, Uber senior DBA, boss of DBAs, DBA team lead, and then uh, governor of California. Uh, no, but the, the interesting thing is some people do 
are almost proud of this process, right? They're, they're kind of like, well, you know, this is how our team has worked for 10, 15 years. You know, this is just how it's always been. It's a mindset thing. They have this yeah. belief that, you know, we are a team and we can write good scripts and they will go upstream. And the things that aren't considered are what happens, not, not if, what happens when something goes wrong? Or what happens when we need to respond faster to changes? And of course, it's not scalable, nor is it sustainable. We've spoken about this before as well, like people wanting to insert themselves as crucial cogs in the machine because oh, yeah. they they believe that that will give them uh, power in some way or that will... Uh, longevity, yeah. Exactly. Whereas the, you know, the, the danger is actually the reverse of that, that all that does is really mean that you you can't be promoted by the business or moved on to more interesting exciting things because you have this responsibility that no one else can do yeah absolutely so, yeah, which is similar to knowledge hoarding but it's slightly different way it's like inserting yourself as a crucial part of the process mm. well if i if i mean if i was to say what is the enemy of devops if if i could pick one thing that was the enemy of devops I think I would probably pick the word silos because people like to silo themselves, like give that to me. That's my job. I'm not going to show anyone how to do it, but also that that goes for teams and goes for learning as well. Some, some teams like to silo themselves off and spoiler alert, everyone who's listening, even if you as a team based on our definitions on DBAL, find yourself in the highest performing team, right? Find yourself in that gold medal position. If you also aren't sharing that knowledge with the wider organization or also potentially taking part in, you know, uh, center of excellence work or um, documenting everything, getting that knowledge disseminated to the rest of the company, then you're actually not the highest performing because actually you're still forming a silo and you should be looking to if you can modernize your process enough that you are a high performer then what's stopping the rest of your organization if if you're sharing with the rest of the organization and you not only as a team but as an as a company are working at high performance and constantly reviewing wicked then hats off to you here's to you cheers mm. but I oh is there a but? Go on. but oh no but don't silo yourself silos <laughs> exist in every form so, so silos around so, people, silos around team we like i agree obviously how do we break those silos though what's the first step so the first step i said well there's a couple of first steps because to adopt DevOps, you need to adjust the way you work for um, organizational change, for technology change, process change. You know, I think we've probably said it to death, right? But people, process, tooling. The combination mm -hmm. of these three things means that we're working in a more DevOps style fashion-ish, right? We're working towards this DevOps approach. And the first thing is to just get everyone's mindset there, right? So we're on the bronze level here. We're talking about the, what, what puts you on that bronze podium stand. And realistically, that all starts with the beginnings of a mindset change. Taking people who perhaps historically have thought yeah, we'll write some scripts and we'll hand them over to the DBA and now getting them to think a bit more like, hey, maybe we should have some kind of object level history, some kind of version of what we're doing. Version control on the application side, our C sharp files, our Java files, whatever. It's almost unthinkable that we wouldn't put that into some kind of version control, even if that was like subversion or team foundation version control, not even Git, but some kind of historical version control so that we have revisions of our work. And cru crucially, like version control is, you know, at its heart, a way of sharing data amongst teams, right? Breaking those silos. 
Exactly. So if you're all working, you know, a lot of people still work on these kind of large monolithic databases that are 20, 25 years old, and they're basically spaghetti, right? You've got stored procedures referencing another stored procedure in a, another database that references a linked server that references a function in another database that's actually on a linked server somewhere else. And you're like, ah, oh, this is this is an absolute nightmare. But by starting to get things into version control, you start giving people this kind of visibility into what other teams are doing. And instead of having five teams working on the same database and trying not to step on each other's toes, by getting it into version control, you can see exactly who is making what change, when and why. And it really does become that, that kind of source of truth. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Do you, do you come ahead. across? I, I was gonna. I was gonna counter with a question. Actually, I, I did. All, sorry, there was also one thing, but you oh, said that it becomes a monolith of spaghetti. Yeah. Um, I really like spaghetti. This is a complete aside, but when people say spaghetti code, like spaghetti is like one of my favorite foods. Like spaghetti is also one really of my favorite code. foods. As long as it's whole wheat spaghetti, because I need need me that fiber, bro. But do you? Well, no. As a as a vegan, I I generally do quite well for fiber, <laughs> but whole wheat is still better for you, isn't it? None of those empty carbs. Good, oh, uh, don't get me wrong. Regular spaghetti. Oh, amazing. Especially gonna... covered in sugar. Anyway, sorry. But I was going to say to you, obviously. Uh, version control, obviously version control is quite a new uh, subject for a lot of developers and let alone putting the database into version control. And if you go back, uh, anyone who's listening, if you go back and listen to when Chris and I talked about state versus migrations versus this kind of hybrid approach of version control, I think it was literally like second or third episode we ever did on DVL, uh, source control, how and why. Uh, I think you know, putting that aside, let's say that we decide as a team, we are going to go from wooden spoon to bronze. Yeah. And we're going to start by looking to put the database into source control. What would you first recommend we look into? Not putting the database into source control, but what kind of things should we start looking at? As in like you're working on a, on a new project and you want to get... Like we're database developers and we have never used version control before. That's an interesting idea. There's a lot of things that kind of come to mind. Um, I guess best practice and documentation could be uh, right to in, in there as long as it's not captured in Word. Um, <laughs> like text files generally, like that's what version control is built for. So if you've got text files for the documentation, it's a really easy thing to capture in there. And especially if you're going to describe what goes in there, you know, yeah. document your stuff first before you put it in there. And then, of course, the app code is going to be the easier one to put in the database code. So it usually goes before the database code. But don't let anyone tell you you can't version a database. Oh, you absolutely can, 100%. And I would just say, like, looking into version control commands, just getting used to it. You know, I've worked with a number of customers who, you know, when I've introduced this kind of idea to them of, hey, you can put your database in a, in a repository. You can put it under Git. And they go, well, how does Git work? And that's the point at which you need to start breaking it down and saying, OK, you've got branches. On these branches, you can create a pull request that then merges it back into the main code base. So your main commands are like Git pull, Git push, Git commit, Git add you know, get in it, get rebase, all these sorts of things, right? Um, or if I believe you can uh, rename those as well, right? So you can, you can whatever you like. You can rename your git push to git yeet if you would like. So every time you're finished with your code, you can yeet it to your remote. Uh, but enough about that. Uh, I think hey. the important thing to yeet, the important thing to bear in mind is that you should... Before trying to put a database under version control, you should get familiar with that version control system because otherwise you will find yourselves in a pickle. Um, you know, you might 
try and create a branch off of an existing branch with some source code on it and not know what the heck is going on. Or conversely, you might get your database under version control on your trunk and, and then just work, well, just stick to trunk-based development when there are a lot of other really useful methodologies out there like uh, Git flow and GitHub flow. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we've got all our stuff in version control. Everything's hunky dory. Um, Theoretically. What's our next step, Chris? How do we how do we go from bronze to silver? Uh, interestingly, silver is probably the probably one of the easiest steps to achieve once you're at bronze. It's hitting that gold that's going to be the hardest, but. I'll leave that for you to go over. Uh, I'll take the easy one, as always. Uh -huh. uh, so silver, interestingly, is, is a kind of a combination of three things. Number one is this kind of continuous delivery on the application side. So, uh, you've got your, again, your C-sharp code, your Java code, your front-end code, whatever, in version control, you're building it, you're deploying it. That's all fine. Okay, you've got full automation there. And what we're now looking for, instead of, you know, instead of uh, bronze, which is kind of exploring the realms of version control, silver becomes this kind of looking for parity. And silver is very much okay. The front end devs, they know what they're doing. They're building. They're deploying. Now we need to start looking into: is it possible to build? the database code as well. Is it possible to somehow take all of our scripts, whether they be state scripts, declarative scripts, inversion control, or migration scripts, and is there any way for us to effectively build the database to kind of replicate this, um, this bottom-up deployment method of, can we take the database and deploy it afresh if need be from version control for onboarding new clients, for instance? And again, this is kind of the stage at which continuous integration takes over, which is anytime we directly affect our master, our main, our trunk, whatever, and we merge code into it or we commit and push directly to it, which you shouldn't do, of course, we use branches, but whenever it picks up behavior on that branch, on that main branch, once we merge back in, that then triggers an automated continuous integration build to validate that all of our code works together as a team or as teams. And by building it from the ground up, you get that idea as to whether or not you can still build from nothing. You can still take a nothing database and then have everything in terms of schema and static data, for instance, you know, zero to hero. And uh, uh, I have know, the Hercules song going in my head. Thank you. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. Bless my soul. Hook was on a roll. No, anyway. <clears throat> yeah, keep uh, going, Chris. Song. Let's get this flagged up on the copyright. Yeah, grounds. exactly. And all of a sudden, <laughs> DBL gets taken down because of a claim by Disney. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. But the point is, this is the this is the bronze is the stage that takes probably the most getting to, right? I mean, I talked about yeah. version control and a mindset change. Getting things into version control is probably surprisingly the biggest jump of the three. And mm -hmm. fair enough, you know, there's very little usually on the medal tables between bronze, silver, and gold. They're normally within hundredths or tenths of a second of each other but it's everyone else below them that's lagging behind. And I think that's important to bear in mind is that it's hardest to get to bronze. And then you've just got that little extra push to get to silver or gold. And with silver, you have that mental change. You have that internal culture kind of in transformation. People are adopting these best practices. People are speaking, forming these centers of excellence, and understanding really what good DevOps practices means. We're adopting Agile and Sprints and but, other methodologies. But, but, but I'd say well, this kind of harks back to one thing you said just now is that like silver is probably like the easiest one to get to once you're at the bronze level. And I, I'd agree. And I, I personally say that's probably because it can mostly be achieved purely through adopting technology. Like you can get to a CI step 
by just plugging all the bits together and you're at silver, right? That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, and it doesn't really impact things if you if you don't want it to. Yes. Like you could just be running these bills in a black room and with a black box and it never tells anything whether you've had a success or not. And technically you've achieved <clears> silver, <throat> but have you really changed anything? And this That's is why true. I'd say that the gold is the hard one to get to because yes, it is fundamentally the same technology and you're just extending it. But the hard step, the leap of faith, the like, the um, that that moment, that light bulb moment, is having the trust, the faith, and the culture within the company to deploy automatically downstream the whole way mm. um, without there being excessive manual checks, L releasing those manual checks, so leaning back, and, yeah. So specifically, we're moving on to gold here. And, and mm -hmm. to be fair, gold in this sense is, uh, as you've already talked about, it's, it's CD. But realistically, what we mean by CD isn't just continuous deployment, right? We can't all be Facebook. We can't all be Microsoft. We can't all be, you know, pumping everything directly from version control all the way to prod just because we trust our automated tests. So continuous delivery, continuous deployment, we've talked about before, but you know, what are the kind of changes that do need to happen for us to, to move to gold from silver? What kind of feedback does there need to be in place for us to know, to have the confidence to achieve gold? As I said, for me, I think it's, it's, it's all about trust. Like you say that we can't all be Facebook, but I don't know. If a lot of companies can there are True. obviously exceptions to this but you know we can deliver completely seamlessly and we have to know and understand that actually that is better it is the trust for me is knowing that you can trust your developers not to put out something poor rather than putting in a series of systems and checks in place to catch anything rubbish that might come out yeah. instead trust your developers to know that they know what they're doing and put out good stuff and that's a hard one that's a very hard one but trust is crucial trust is like the main thing when it comes to building a team yeah. right and devops fundamentally like you said is about breaking silos it's about building one big team dev and ops do you know do you know what was said to me recently on a webinar that i did with uh with one of our partners out of the uae um, we we were talking, his, his name's uh, Deepak, and he's absolutely phenomenal. And oh my gosh, the best voice ever. Just oh, if just go back and find the webinar, go on my LinkedIn, go on the Redgate events page, and just uh, go and find go and find this webinar with me and Deepak talking about transformation via DevOps. But uh, DevOps, uh, Deepak basically said that DevOps. And this is where I think it's going to be really relevant to the gold medal. He said, he literally said the phrase, DevOps is empathy. Mm. And that, that really hit me right in there. He said, DevOps is empathy. DevOps is about understanding and it's about sharing, and about breaking things down. And it's about, you know, communication and knowing how to, you know, help solve situations, help, you know, how to achieve your goals as a business, whilst making sure that you've got this constant feedback, constant understanding, constant, you know, communication, and about having that empathy, because at the end of the day, everyone who's doing DevOps at an organization is a person right? We use scripts to automate everything. We use Terraform and Kubernetes, and we use Azure DevOps and GitHub and GitHub Actions, and we use SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, whatever. Don't really matter. Because at the end of the day, it all starts with a developer making a change. And Indeed. that change needs to get to prod. So yeah, for people tuning in and they're like, how do we get to amazing DevOps? And the answers you've got is empathy and trust. I, I can feel some eyes rolling. Oh <laughs> Super no. Super hard. But yeah, I mean, it, it is about that. Like it's about getting everyone's buy-in to implement these systems yeah. and actually use them rather than um, 
you know, mm-hmm. put, just doing a, a checkbox exercise to get them in place. Exactly. And, you know, even gold performers, you know, we can be more prescriptive and we can say, hey, you should be using like cloud based technologies. You should be uh, utilizing platform as a service where possible or, you know, moving to containerization and, you know, breaking that link between the operating system and your and your database and your application code, etc. And we can tell you all of that. But I tell you what, there are people adopt adopting those newer technologies who don't have the right mindset who don't sorry not the right mindset but who don't have the mindset of empathy of trust of automated testing of you know understanding the issues and gathering feedback as early as possible they're they're on the cusp they're on this kind of wave of technology which is fantastic but if you don't have that mindset if you don't follow some of those principles, you know, if you end up like, uh, what's his name? Is it, um, is it Clint or something in, uh, in the Phoenix project? What's his name? Um, oh, um, do you mean the single point of failure? Yeah. Keeps oh, getting pulled from oh. project to project. That's really annoying. I've had a complete mind blank on that. Um, you doing a quick Google. Google. You're going to Google it. Right. Okay. So uh, if you haven't already, uh, go and read The Phoenix Project, because honestly, it's one of my absolute favorite books. And the the sequels are not bad as well. You've got the DevOps Handbook. Brent, of course it is. Yes, Uh, we're similarly named to our beloved Brent Ozar as well. Uh, But Brent, the single point of failure, the person who is drafted in to fix everything else, you know, even if Brent is working with, like I say, Terraform, Kubernetes, like infrastructure as code, uh, working with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Maybe they're working with quantum computing. It really doesn't matter if you don't follow the right principles, the right kind of methodologies, which ultimately mean that you're able to capture feedback quickly and efficiently and then act on that feedback. If you're still handing scripts up to production, any manner of things can go wrong. There is no governance there. And ultimately, you're putting yourself and your process more at risk by doing that. DevOps means just good people with good mindsets, good process, and good tooling. Oh, yeah. All those white hats. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that ultimately leads to your gold medal. But again, like we said at the very beginning, it doesn't Let's matter if you're a gold medal winner. It doesn't matter if you're the highest performing in the world. If you don't keep on it, if you don't keep gathering that feedback and responding to it, you'll end up in silver, then you'll end up in bronze, and then you'll end up with your wooden spoon. Oh, yeah. All right, then. So that's how to get to gold. You heard it here first. What next, Chris? Well... Next, my beer is gone, unfortunately. <laughs> and I'm doing not so. Take long. And pr- fortunately, from the previous session, I was not able to uh, eat beforehand. So it's, it's going well, I would say. It's going, I'm strong start, right? I'm, I'm a, a very strong, I it would say, five second hundred of meter. Alcoholics. Exactly. Uh, not something we joke about, but uh, at least I'm, what, what's the word? High functioning. There you go. Let's oh, go yes. Uh, let's go with high functioning. It's theoretically, at least medium functioning. Functioning. <laughs> Bro, I can't even speak anymore. But, but, but. it is time for... <clears throat> right. The news. The news. The news. Stop. <laughs> the news. All right, it's time for the news. Chris, what's the news? <laughs> So, um, there's a small event that happened in uh, Japan recently that you might have heard of. It's called the um, hang on, Olium Pikes. Uh, so, yeah, loads of people descended on Japan. Uh, no, they didn't. Um, Oops. I mean, lots of Japanese re- people went to Tokyo. 
Did they? I didn't think they had crowds. Well, a few people did. There was some. I thought there were some crowds. <laughs> some small crowds. crowds. Small crowds. Uh, so yeah, we had a big event in Japan and another big event in Japan that is uh, currently ongoing at time of recording. Um, so yeah, the these kind of events they roll around every few years and they tend to attract a lot of cyber related crime. Every four yes. years, Chris. That's how the Olympics works. Every four years. Oh, really? So when was the last Olympics then, Chris? Uh, this was the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, Chris. <laughs> what year is it now, Chris? 2021, Chris. So the last Olympics was how long ago, Chris? Five, five years. <laughs> it doesn't count. And you're not even counting the Winter Olympics. Like, a lot actually, of to be fair, I do love very the, angry about that. I do love the Winter Olympics, actually. I re- do you know what? I really love curling really love curling like i just i can't i get behind it and i see that little um i see the hammer is it a hammer is it they they, they call it a hammer i think or something they, they throw hammer, the thing yeah. they throw the disc uh the big old chunky thing and it goes up the ice and they're brushing away and i'm just like oh my gosh yeah uh, anyway. like who, who created this sport anyway well, no but the olympics so- it's a big focus of cybercrime because people suck and obviously it's going to be a big focus of cybercrime. There have been reports of all kinds of weird and wonderful things come out from this. So simple phishing, um, a lot of you know fake giveaways essentially. Click this button and we'll give you this competition prize of a TV and um, obviously it's completely fake. There's a website called olympictickets2020.com um, that was used by scammers to sell fake tickets. Wow. Yeah. We had a um, malicious PDF that was being sent around, called, including something called a wiper, which um, essentially just deleted a whole load of stuff that uh, was on that user's uh, system, which obviously sucks. Yes. There was a uh, data sharing tool uh, from Fujitsu, that uh, compromised a whole bunch of organizations as well. But the one I want to go into in a little bit of detail is, um, well, uh, uh, the one in which a bunch of ticket holders or those looking to um, volunteer for the event, uh, unfortunately had some of their, their data leaked. So apparently not many, the, 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 number given the exact number was not large which is always very very useful um but essentially their portal information was leaked which meant that scammers could use that information to log into the portal and from there get a load of sensitive information further so yeah olympics not ideal not ideal Place gold medal in fun. lacking security Oh, yes. Um, But yeah, apparently this happens every single Olympics. Um, There was actually a team of white hats that was hired by the Japanese government specifically to try and dig out as much of these as possible um, before the event. Obviously not hugely successful, but, you know, um, I guess you never will be, really. You can only, only do as much as you can. Second piece of news I've got is uh, IBM have run a report on the cost of a data breach. And what they found is that a data breach um, has grown in dollar impact cost, which kind of makes sense, you know, inflation and all that. Um, Each incident, how much do you think each incident is going to be costing each company that it hits on average? Don't give me a number. Two. Uh, incorrect. The answer I was looking for is 4.24 million US dollars. Oh, I was do- jolly close though. Yeah, but you were doing it in pounds, so I guess so. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. So, 4.24 million dollars per data breach, which is crazy. Like one slip up on an IT operations team costs four million dollars. So, surely it's worth. Uh, it's not always it ops do you remember we talked about we talked about this we talked about a hospital that threw out all of its printers and it had (laughs) the documents on the hard drives and they were in landfill that was a breach 
That's not an IT security slip up. That's just a, we threw out our old hardware, but oops. Well, I mean, technically it is an IT op slip up. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the point point is very true, but you know, that it could ultimately be a user failure. It could be a developer failure. It's not just operations, that's true. but yeah, $4.24 million is a big mistake. That's it from the yes. news from me. How about you, Chris? Well, I don't have any news specifically, but I do have a list of uh, of events that are going to be taking place. There are a couple uh, in the calendar, in the calendar that I've got in front of me. I'm sure there are more as well, uh, but there are a couple of data Saturdays coming up, uh, Saturday 15 and 14, Plovdiv and Oslo respectively, Bulgaria and Norway uh, up there on the chart. So Plovdiv is August 28th, I think, as I mentioned last time. Oslo is September the 4th. Uh, also, you've got Data Saturdays uh, Croatia as well, September the 11th, and Data Saturday Sofia, uh, October 9th. Again, Bulgaria, look at you up on the Data Saturdays. I like it. Uh, but there are, there are also a couple of things I should mention. Data Platform Virtual Summit. I believe I mentioned this last time as well, but if you're not already attending the Data Platform Virtual Summit, please do go over and get registered for that because it's going to be an absolutely fantastic event. I've already seen some of the speakers and really uh, it's just going to be blown out of the park. Um, the one I really should definitely mention though, because the registrations open for it this week, no less, well, I think in the last week, is the Past Data Community Summit 2021. So Ooh. if you go to Past... If you go to Past... Data... I'm a big fan of the, the Past Summit 2021. And do you know why? Because it's in 2021? No, because one of my good friends is going to be speaking there. Is it Grant Fritchie? No. Guess again. Is it me... Yeah. Yay! Yes, that's right. Shamelessly, I will also be speaking at the Pass Data Community Summit. So if you go to passdatacommunitysummit.com or just Google Pass Data Community Summit, you will find the page. It is hosted by Redgate with a premier sponsor of Microsoft. There are also additional sponsors uh, for Pass as well. It is a community event. We want to bring everyone together and we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak about topics that matter to them. And actually, there are a whole bunch of sessions taking place across a whole host of different uh, learning pathways. And that includes pre-conference sessions, half-day sessions, general sessions, and lightning talks. In fact, there are just over 212 sessions across the 8th to the 12th of November. And guess what, Chris? What? It's free! Woo! What are you speaking about? Uh, I'm going to be so I'm going to be speaking about putting in place an end to end uh, deployment pipeline with Azure SQL database, Azure DevOps and uh, Flyway DB. So I'm going to be using Flyway Community Edition to put in place a free uh, DevOps pipeline for my dev test and prod Azure SQL databases. And I'll be using the Flyway Docker image in my YAML to do that. Nice. Nice indeed. So yes, do get yourself across to pastdatacommunitysummit.com and take a look at some of those sessions. Uh, and hopefully we will see you there. But that is all from me for the uh, events rundown. Uh, I think that all that's left for us to say is, of course, number one, Congratulations to everyone who's been competing in the Olympics and in the uh, Paralympics. Obviously, um, normally we would have a theme like a silly day or something like that. But I think it's all just worthwhile us giving a clap out to those uh, uh, hardworking Olympians who have strived to be the best of the best of the best. Uh, and I think that's something that we can all take under our uh, uh, take take into kind of our own learnings. I can finger gun that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But for now, Chris, thank you so much, as always. And thank you, everyone at home for uh, or in the car or wherever you are listening to us. Thank you for joining us. It is, as always, an absolute pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you for the three 
year dbl anniversary next time that is of course dbl 36 but for now we've got our numbers cheers